We're continuing our series through the book of Genesis, Genesis 35, and we'll read the first eight verses this morning. This is uh, the aftermath of the incident at Shechem, where Dinah was assaulted. The sons of Jacob ended up through trickery, coming in and destroying the Canaanite city of Shechem. And after that, we pick up our story here, chapter 35, beginning with verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And if you look in your Bibles, that little squiggly note, El Bethel, it means uh, God, the God of Bethel. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Elan Bakuth, that is the oak of weeping. So far the reading of God's word this morning, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open as we're going to be referring to our text a number of times. Well, friends, what gives uh, your neighbors meaning or purpose Perhaps uh, their family relationships, maybe uh, their work, their occupation, uh, increasingly informal work, uh, one's politics, uh, bringing justice or supporting certain causes or candidates. Well, we're going to see that the Christian's purpose, as the Heidelberg Catechism Q&A 1 says, our only comfort is belonging to Christ. And we're going to see this purpose in the person of Deborah. And uh, now, I want you to remember this story of Deborah. Deborah is not a very famous person in the Bible. But uh, kids, when you look at the red oak tree, it's the wolves just planted it actually a few weeks ago. So when you see the red oak tree in the back of our courtyard there, remember about oak trees and this story of Deborah. Now, Deborah, what do we know about her? She's referenced here just in verse 8. Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, uh, what do we know about her? We only read her about two places in the Bible. Here in verse 8, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died. She was buried under an oak tree below Bethel. So Jacob called its name Elan Bakuth, that is the oak of weeping. We read about her here. And we also read about her, at least a little bit, in Genesis 24, verses 59 and following. So I'll just read those couple of verses. So, now this goes back many decades. So that uh, they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed Abraham's servant. And thus Abraham's servant took Rebekah and went his way back to Isaac, where they were, Rebekah was married. So we only read about Rebekah in these two places. Uh, we don't even know her name until our text today, 35 verse 8, when she dies. <laughs> so we finally know her name when she dies and is buried. And it's actually remarkable that she's mentioned at all in Scripture. According to Jewish scholars, it's very, very unusual for an obscure woman to be mentioned at all. Women were not 
usually leaders in the culture back then. And someone like Deborah, this isn't like Deborah the judge, whom God used in the time of the judges to bring about a great victory. This is Rebecca's nurse. So, you know, very obscure and very unusual that she would even be mentioned here. So, who is she? And why is her name recorded in the Bible? Well, as mentioned, we don't know much about her. Uh, she is Rebecca's nurse. Rebecca is the wife of Isaac the patriarch. Uh, and we know that uh, she served Rebecca while she still lived in Haran before Rebecca left her family to marry Isaac. And so when Rebecca left her family to marry Isaac, Deborah the nurse went with her. So left the land of Haran and went to be with the patriarchs, with Isaac. And uh, we don't know for sure, but the nurse Deborah probably raised Rebecca and took care of her. She was probably a slave. And she grew attached to Rebekah over the years. And so she made the journey to the land of Canaan to live with the patriarchs. Uh, what else do we know about her? Well, you know, interestingly, Rebekah's death and burial isn't mentioned in the Bible. But Rebekah's nurse, Deborah, Deborah's death and burial are mentioned. Again, very unusual. So why is Deborah the nurse? mentioned at all? Well, maybe because she's a nurse, right? Um, you know, a lot of Reformed Presbyterian Christians say that a Christian's calling or occupation is one of our most important identities. And these folks would say that it is up to you and your calling and your work to not only glorify God and love your neighbor, but through your work to redeem or restore God's shalom, God's kingdom, through your calling. Folks who teach this, they call themselves, this big fancy word, but neo kyperians or proponents of the reform world and life view. So, as a nurse, they would say, Deborah was supposed to be God's hand of healing in a broken world, and if she really understood her craft well maybe her nursing insights would carry over even into the next life, in the new heavens and the new earth. She would bring the best of her craft into the new Jerusalem, as it were. Like Revelation says, the kings of the earth will bring their treasures into the new Jerusalem. And So kind of like what Jubal in Genesis 4, he was the master of music, the music arts. So perhaps Deborah is the master of being an excellent caretaker. Who knows, right? Maybe. Um, Well, no. I don't think so. Now, we are called to serve God in our callings. And we are to glorify God in every area of our life, including our work. And we are to love our neighbor by serving them well with the gifts that God has given us. And so... I'm sure Deborah was a faithful and a good nurse and caretaker, and that is a worthwhile calling. But the Bible does not say that we are redeeming anything with our work and our occupations. Only Christ has done the redeeming work of saving us from the wrath of God against our sin and crediting his perfect righteousness and obedience to us when we trust in him and rest in Christ. And so Christ's work is the only work that truly redeems anything. And it's not even just his redemptive work in saving us from the wrath of God and making us sons and daughters. Even the work of developing creation, which our neo kyperian friends like to talk about so much, even there, who is going to be doing most of the development of culture and building the city? Is it our work? Is it my work as a lawyer that's going to carry over into the next life? No. Christ is the one. He he is the one who said, I am going away from you, disciples, to what? To, I'm going to prepare the place for you. (laughs) Jesus is the one who is building the new Jerusalem. 
And he is the one at the end of history who's going to bring the great city, the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the earth. He is the one who's prepared it and is going to bring it down to us. So our work as fathers and mothers or lawyers or business people or nurses, that's not going to even contribute or impact what is to come. Christ is the only one who's redeeming anything. So what the Bible does say about our work and our callings is if we do our work as unto the Lord in gratitude for Christ's salvation, then God will see it and he will out of his grace reward his children with new opportunities and responsibilities and joys in the new creation. We read that in Colossians 3 in the reading of the law. And that's why in Colossians 3, which we just read, God tells slaves to serve their masters as if they were serving the Lord. Christian slaves were not called to redeem slavery or to be agents of shalom and transforming work. Being a slave was terrible. And yet, Paul didn't say the main goal of the Christian faith is to do away with all these fallen structures. Christians, on the other hand, will be richly rewarded if we do our work in a fallen world as unto the Lord. It's not redemptive. We're not transforming work relations that it's going to go into the eternal new Jerusalem. Christ is the only one that's redeeming. So, as Deborah the nurse mentioned, because she is transforming the fallen world by being a visionary nurse and caretaker. No. But then that brings us back to the question, why is Deborah the nurse mentioned? Well, it doesn't tell us exactly, but I think there are things in the text that give us some answers. We know that Deborah, the nurse, lived with Isaac's family. And it's implied here that at the end of her life, she lived with Jacob's family. It's implied. And so, as someone who lived with the family of Isaac and Jacob for decades, we know through our study of Genesis that she saw a lot of sin and treachery committed even by Isaac, but certainly by Jacob, She knew that the patriarchs and their families and their clans were marred by a lot of sin. But what else did she witness? Although she saw a lot of brokenness in the clan of Abraham, she also heard about the great God of the patriarchs. She undoubtedly knew that the living God made many gracious promises to the sinful patriarchs. Promises to be their God, to be near to them, to live with them in a land even greater than Canaan. And although we don't know exactly when and where Deborah rejoined Jacob's clan, it's reasonable to assume that she was present during the events of Genesis 35, because that's the setting for what we, or Genesis 34. And that's the setting of Genesis 35 then. I'd like to read verses 1, 6 through 8 again. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up from Shechem to Bethel in Canaan and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. And then verse 6. And so Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who were with him. And there Jacob built an altar and called the place El Bethel, God, the house of God, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. And there Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried under an oak below Bethel. So he called its name Elan Bakuth, the oak of weeping. She certainly must have heard about Bethel. And what God did at Bethel. How many years earlier, two decades earlier, how he appeared to wicked Jacob, who was fleeing his wrathful brother because of his treachery. But instead of pronouncing judgment, 
he showed that God wanted Jacob to be near to him, to dwell even in the house of God. Hence the name Bethel, Bethel, house of God. Can you imagine the true living God dwelling near sinful people like Jacob? That is our greatest hope, isn't it? Like David, Psalm 27, verse 4, one thing, one thing I seek. This is what my heart's desire is, one thing, that I may dwell in the house of God all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. She also knew that this great hope of dwelling with God was not going to permanently happen in Bethel, in the land of Canaan, right? Why else would Jacob have only built altars in Bethel and not cities? She knew that the patriarchs were called to be sojourners, to live in tents, to build altars, not cities, as signs of what was to come. As the writer of Hebrews says, Abraham and the patriarchs, they lived as sojourners and pilgrims and strangers looking for the city whose architect and builder was God in the future. So she knew that the cities of Canaan, like Shechem, that they just left in chapter 34, and Bethel, were not her true lasting home. And finally, so she knew all that. We know that she knew that, right? If she is part of those families. Those were critically important events in those families' lives. And finally, though, she probably wondered, well, how could a holy God live near a really big scoundrel like Jacob? How could a holy God live near Jacob in peace and in blessing? Well, she certainly also must have heard about the patriarch's great religious sign ritual. And although they were sinners, all the males as head of each family, what, as members of the clan of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had to receive the sign of circumcision, the cutting off of the unclean flesh and the shedding of blood. Surely, Deborah must have known that it was through the sign of the shedding of blood, the death of the unclean, that had something to do with guilty sinners being spared the wrath of God and be able to dwell near a holy God in his presence. Friends, I think that we read about Deborah the nurse not because she was redeeming the culture by being an awesome caretaker. But rather, we read about Deborah the nurse because she knew about her and her clan's sin and misery. She knew that God would provide someone who, like the sign of circumcision, would be cut off whose blood would be shed on behalf of guilty people. She knew that because of God's coming Savior, she too would be able to forever live in an eternal Bethel, the house of God. And that her pilgrimage and service on this earth, in the cities of Canaan, they were not her true home, but they were signs of the greater blessings to come. In short, friends, I think we read about Deborah because she was a woman of faith. She, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, trusted that God would send a Savior who would make her righteous and who would bring her to dwell in the beautiful Bethel, the presence of God. Friends, I don't think Deborah was a a titan of transforming culture and bringing shalom. She did not accomplish great things. But instead, she was a daughter of Abraham, as it were, who trusted God and looked for a future reward.
And so, friends, what does Deborah the nurse have to do with you and with me? Well, you, like Deborah, we, we have journeyed with the patriarchs as we followed their stories on the pages of the book of Genesis the last several months. And these stories aren't just true accounts of things that happened to real people thousands of years ago. These stories connect with you and with me because we follow the same path, as it were. We have seen our sin and misery how we mistreat our neighbors and even our own family members sometimes. We have seen uh, in the sign of circumcision in the Old Testament that our only hope for having peace with a holy, righteous God is if someone else takes on himself our sin and misery and is cut off, whose blood is shed. And you know who has fulfilled that Old Testament sign of circumcision, don't you? It's Jesus Christ, the true son of Abraham. And you know that your only hope of receiving the peace and blessing of a holy, righteous God is if you rest completely in the saving work of the substitute, Jesus Christ. And you also know that in Christ, you will someday be able to draw near to the holy, living God in the eternal Bethel, as it were. You know that in Christ, you too can say Psalm 27, verse 4, one thing I have desired, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, the house of God, Bethel, all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. But you also know that these blessings grasp now through faith in Christ. They're also future. That you too, like Deborah, you will die and you will be buried unless Christ returns very quickly. But that you, like Deborah, like all who trust in Christ, that you will be raised someday to live in the eternal Bethel in God's house forever. Friend, in this sense, our message from Scripture is be like Deborah, the nurse. (laughs) That is, rest in Christ and his saving work. Looking for the joy and pleasure of being near to God someday. And just as Deborah was buried under an oak tree near Bethel. Kids, this is where I started the message and this is where we'll end it. I encourage you to remember your future in Christ when you see the oak tree. Because of your sin, you too, you will die. And you will be buried. But if you rest in Christ, you too will be raised to an eternity of life in Bethel, the real house of God. Let's go before God's throne in prayer. Let's pray.